Welcome back to the Talking Stocks podcast. Joe and Todd with you as always with our very special guest today, Brian Feraldi. Brian is a writer for The Motley Fool, can be found on Twitter as he has on his wonderful little green screen there at Brian Feraldi. Uh, Brian, great to have you here. We're so happy you're with us. Joe, Todd, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So why don't we kick it off uh, and just you can just give us a little bit of background of like how you how you got into the investing world and uh, how you how you got writing for for The Motley Fool. So, yeah, kick us off. Like most people, I was taught absolutely nothing about investing when I was a kid, literally zero. And when I graduated from college, my dad gave me rich dad, poor dad, as a, as a, not a graduation present, but as they said, hey, this is a book that you should read. That was like right when it came out. I read it in a few days, just absolutely devoured it and realized that I loved, I was just naturally attracted to everything related to money, personal finance, and investing. From there, I just read every single book on money or personal finance that I could get my hands on. When I was out of college, I was hired at a startup medical device company that just went on to be ridiculously successful. It's publicly traded today. It's worth tens of billions of dollars. And it was just sheer luck that I got my foot in the door uh, with them as a, a, um, through a family friend. While I was there, I was in sales for them for 10 years. And one of the great things about being in sales is that you were in your car 30 plus hours per week driving around and traveling. I used all of those 30 hours to listen to audiobooks, to listen to conference calls, to listen to podcasts and just grow my personal knowledge about investing. Through that journey, I got hooked up with The Motley Fool. I absolutely loved everything about the company. I became a paying subscriber. I went to the headquarters and met some of the people. And then about five years ago, I was afforded the opportunity to write for them. Um, and I jumped at it and been doing that ever since. Brian, it is so great to see your smiling face again. You too, Todd. It's been, uh, it's been too long, my friend, and it's great to have you here to talk stocks with us today. And uh, you're just such a generous, kind, nice person. I'm just, and you drop so much wisdom on Twitter and it's just, it's wonderful to have you here and be able to kind of pick your brain. And one of the things that, you know, you tend to talk a lot about on Twitter and, you know, share some really good insight on it, are, are issues revolving like personal finance and the intersection of personal finance and investing in life. And, you know, I've been spending some time over the course of the last few weeks thinking about, you know, the pitfalls that people make in decision, decision making when it comes to investing in money. And I kind of labeled it into three different buckets. I labeled it into lifestyle, lifestyle choices. So, you know, overspending, spend more than, than you really should based on your income. The use of leverage. So for me, that'd be, you know, I'd, I'd throw that into the margin and options and maybe debt for depreciating assets camp. And then mindset, which I think is very important to have the right mindset to be able to manage your emotional decision making. And I was just, I wanted to get some thoughts uh, from you because I know that you know, you mentioned um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, um, you know, it's kind of like that millionaire next door. It's those kind of, those kind of concepts. I was kind of wanted to get from you, your take on, you know, how people should approach things like lifestyle, leverage, and mindset when it comes to making, to money decisions and, and financial security. If you follow me on Twitter, you might think that I believe that stock picking is the ultimate activity and it's the most important I am actually a firm believer that learning and understanding personal finances is an order of magnitude more important than learning how to uh, invest. You could be the best stock picker in the world. If your personal finances are in shambles and you literally have no money to invest, if I told you to buy the next Amazon today, it would do you no good because you have no money to invest. Conversely, if you're a terrible investor and the only thing you do is buy bonds or CDs, but you have a 50% savings rate over 40 or 50 years, you're going to do great financially. So overall, I think that understanding and mastering the most important principles and concepts related to personal finance is incredibly important. 
And personal finance and money, uh, it's kind of like diet and exercise. It's very easy to accidentally become overweight or unhealthy, just like it's very easy to accidentally become poor and saddle yourself up with debt. And it's imperative that you learn the most important money principles so that you can make yourself fiscally fit in the exact same way it's important to learn the most important dieting principles so you can make yourself physically uh, fit. So when it comes to personal finance, I am a huge advocate of developing your income and creating multiple sources of income for yourself. Many people rely on one source of income for their entire life. And that's because that's the kind of thing that we were taught when we were growing up by our parents and, and by, by school. If you can learn to develop multiple income streams in your life, you realize that your income potential is actually unlimited. And just learning that very basic concept that your income potential is actually unlimited, that's, a, that's, that's not something that many people uh, talk about. Once you have income coming in, it's incredibly important that you learn how to spend your money wisely. And spending your money wisely always starts with the exact same thing with me. It's watching and tracking how you spend your money. I've done financial coaching with a lot of friends and family. And the first thing we do is we just make a very simple income statement and we look at their spending categories. Every single time I've done that, people's jaw hit the floor when they realize how much they are spending on certain things. And it, you like almost automatically make behavioral changes to reduce spending in categories once you have the numbers uh, in front of you. When you're young, it's really important that you master uh, the basics of keeping your, your, your expenses low because when you're young, your income is typically uh, really low. So learning how to cook for yourself, how to drive an, an old car, how to maintain things, how to live, live cheaply. If you can do those things in the beginning and start to grow your income, you really start to expand your savings rate. Once your savings rate gets going, it's important to know what to do with that money. I'm a huge advocate of delevering your life as much as possible in the beginning. And that just means delevering is a fancy word of saying paying off debt, build an emergency fund for yourself, really do the basic blocking and tackling so that you can make your personal finances a bulletproof. Once your personal finances are bulletproof, then you can use your excess capital to start to build wealth from yourself, start to learn how to uh, invest. And while I'm a passionate stock picker, I fully recognize that stock picking is not for 98% of people. They're just not built for stock picking. They don't care about it. They don't want to learn. And that is completely fine. Completely fine. You can do wonderful financially without ever learning anything about uh, uh, picking a stock. Uh, but for those people, it's still important for them to learn the extreme basics about investing and just put their money into boring, plain vanilla index funds. You know, I, lo I love what you're saying here, Brian. It just makes so much sense to me intuitively. Which I think we're seeing a lot right now of speculation in the markets, and especially we're seeing that with younger people. Uh, so people who are newer to the workforce. And I think it's kind of going in the reverse order of what you're recommending. I mean, you're recommending, hey, okay, learn as much as you can, maximize your income so you can boost your savings rate, pay off your debt so that you're basically, you're not working for someone else. You can, you, you know, you can invest in yourself rather than, you know, let someone basically uh, pay, pay someone else's um, for, for lending you money. And now I feel like uh, we're seeing a lot of kind of like a, this lottery mindset where I'm going to go out and I'm going to speculate and I'm going to use the money that I'm making by speculating to get myself financially secure. And I think that what I'm hearing you say is that, no, listen, you know, the, the reality is that, you know, this is kind of a, a bizarre time and that, you know, practices and processes are important. Let's get these things in the right order of operations. Are you, is that fair? That's completely fair. And Todd, you've been investing longer than I have. Have you ever seen a weirder year investing wise than 2020? It I, was I, bananas. <laughs> it was bananas. And you know, 2021 says, hold my beer. Totally. It, it really right. does. So 
talking before the show, Brian, Joe and I were talking about GameStop as, as being an example where you get the, this, this runaway momentum because of short covering. And again, it's this speculative kind of thing where people start talking about it and then they start seeing other people making the money and then they start getting FOMO or YOLO or whatever kind of uh, abbreviation you want to do or you want to do. And, and I think that, you know, it's, that's, that worries me a little bit as someone who's been around a little bit. Um, I've seen some of these speculative bubbles. Um, they're, they're fun while they last, but they, they don't last is the problem. And I am a little bit concerned, um, Brian, about you know, what this could look at. But yeah, I mean, 2020, 2021, just um, uh, amazing and uh, uncommon, unprecedented. We went from enormous decline to th one of the biggest bull runs ever, both in the exact same year. One other thing that 2020 did is it took a, it opened a lot of people's eyes to what investing was. People had free time on their hands all of a sudden. They were stuck at home. Uh, they couldn't watch sports. They couldn't do some of their normal activities. And I think a lot of people picked up investing or at least the concept of investing for the very first time. And they saw that you can buy some stocks and do well immediately. Like immediately, you buy, you buy some good stocks and they just immediately went up. The trouble with that is that can lull you into a, for, a false sense of security where you think that if, if you just buy certain stocks, uh, you will instantaneously uh, make money. That is not a lesson that is, that is easy to unteach to people, especially if, they're, if their entire investing experience is, is 2020. Yeah, Brian, I know you and I have talked in the past about, I, I teach a class at, at the University of New Hampshire, how to talk stocks. And oftentimes we'll say to people, you know, especially last year when we were going through that big deep dive, I said, you're learning at the best time because you're losing money. That's right. You, know, you want to lose money early on. You don't want to make money early on. You want to lose money early on because then you learn about risk discipline. And when you learn about risk discipline, I feel like that that's nine tenths of the game because yeah, it's fun to be funny, like you said, just out of the gate, but I'm not sure necessarily that that's teaching you valuable lessons that you can duplicate year after year after year after year. When I first started investing and I put that in air quotes, I was buying penny stocks. Those, those were just was what attracted me. I didn't know anything about investing. I didn't know anything about financial statements, management products, et cetera. The only thing I knew is that these stock prices went up and down. And if I bought a company that was under $5, I could buy more shares and therefore I would make more money uh, faster. I was lucky because I got my teeth kicked in, in in the beginning. I lost hundreds of dollars when I first started investing. That's not a lot of money, but boy, did it feel like a lot of money at the time. So I have lots of mental scars about investing the wrong way uh, early on. And I learned so much in the beginning from losing money that it, it shaped the investor that I, I am today. The other thing that really shaped the investor I am today was 2008. I mean, it's hard when you look at a chart to describe to people that didn't invest through 28, 2008 what it was like to go from in the, the, I think the peak was in the summer of 2007 and the bottom was in March of 2009 and peak the trough, it was like a 60% decline. Relentless. More relentless. Re relentless and even more important than that, it's one thing to show a chart that says going back and here's what happened, but you know, one, that the turn came and two, it's a completely different experience to live through something like that hour by hour, day by day, when every time you turn on the news, it's this business is going bankrupt. This business is laying off company, uh, is laying off employees. And you see the, uh, the employment rate uh, skyrocket. Buying stocks in that kind of environment is incredibly challenging. All the while you see that your past investments that had done well, completely lost their value. So I don't want the bull market that we're currently in to end. It would be great if stocks just always went up forever, but I know that that's not how markets work. They're, 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 the, uh, the current bull market we are in will end and there will be a, a significant uh, decline. And you are not tested as, or know yourself as an investor until you have invested through a significant downturn. So a lot of people that have done really well and got started in 2020, uh, I truly wish them 
prosperity and nothing but the best, but you're, you, you don't know you, who yourself are as an investor until you've gone through one of those really painful downturns. Yeah, completely, completely agree. So speaking of uncertain times to invest, here we are in 2021, which appears to be uh, the follow-up to 2020, hold my beer. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, I want to I wanna pick your brain on how you identify uh, potential winning stocks, especially in such an uncertain time where the the price is not necessarily uh, parallel to the actual performance of the company. My investing process has been refined uh, over the years, but if I was to broadly describe myself as a, an investor, my general strategy is to find the highest quality companies that I possibly can, to buy those companies and then to hold them for a long period of time and outsource all the work of compounding to those businesses. That is just broadly my investing uh, style. Valuation is a part of my investing uh, style and it used to be a much bigger part. However, I've learned the hard way that if you prioritize valuation, you will just not own the best companies that are uh, in the market. But in order to find the quote unquote highest quality, that's obviously a subjective term. Subjective, uh, term. So what I did for myself is I wrote down a list of all of the business characteristics that I find highly appealing uh, in a high quality company. Uh, things like I want a balance sheet with lots of cash and, and no debt. Uh, I want high uh, gross margin. I want revenue growth uh, to be high. I want it to be protected by a wide moat that is expanding uh, over time. I want its customers to be diversified and willing to buy from the company in good times uh, and bad. I want repeat purchase. I don't want one and done uh, customers. I want a management team that is mission driven, uh, invested in the company's success, makes it a great place to work and constantly exceeds expectations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I made this big list of all the things that I highly value in great companies. At the same time, I made another list that, all right, these are the good things I'm looking for. What are the things I don't want uh, an investment? Uh, I don't want accounting problems. I don't want customer concentration. I don't want it, the industry itself to be uh, actively being disrupted. I don't want to buy market, uh, stocks that have lost badly to the market. I don't want to buy companies that dilute shareholders uh, tremendously. I don't want to buy companies that acquire growth. I don't want to buy companies that are dependent on some outside force for success, such as they can only make money when interest rates are high, or they can only make money when energy prices are low, et cetera, et cetera. So I took all the things that I want, and then I subtracted all the things that I, I didn't want, and I basically just made a checklist for myself. It scores, it scores companies on a scale of a zero uh, to a hundred, and I just went through and ranked all of the attributes that I find most appealing, and I weighed them according to what I felt was most important. So I'm a firm believer that a competitive advantage, a moat, is the most important business attribute that a company can have. So out of 100 potential points, I devote 20 points to the size of a company's uh, moat. Another thing that I look for in investment is I want optionality, which is a company's ability to generate new business lines uh, from, from scratch. So that is something that I call optionality. So I put, I put some uh, points on that, et cetera, et cetera. So when I come across a company that I'm interested in, I go top to bottom of my checklist and I ask all, I, I look for all of the metrics that uh, I find appealing and I add them up and then I subtract all of the metrics that I don't find unappealing. That produces a score and I use that score to determine whether or not a company is high quality or not. That's step one. Step two is saying, what's the valuation today? How much is the market paying for that business quality uh, today? And at any given month, when I go to invest, I try and find the highest quality business that I can that is trading at the most attractive valuation. And I simply put my capital into my best ideas monthly and hold those companies for a long time. 
I absolutely love that systematic uh, approach to ranking stocks because there are, there are literally thousands of choices for us as individual stock investors. And I think that it's very important to approach things, you know, in a way that allows us to categorize, okay, these, I like this more than I like this because we don't have unlimited capital, right? Most people, most of our listeners ask, we don't have unlimited capital. I and mean, we have capital theoretically that's maybe coming in in the form of a 401k or an IRA every year that we can deploy, that's great. Um, but I mean, I think that you need to have some sort of a system that allows yourself to be objective in about a particular stock so that you're not falling victim to some of those emotional whipsaw that you can you can very easily can fall victim to. I mean, especially if, you know, anybody who spends any time on FinTwit or um, any of these other kind of places where people are talking about stocks, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, it's very easy to sort of see these things moving and say to yourself, oh, geez, I need to get on that. I need to get in on that. I need to get in on that. And that's a very scary and not maybe not the best approach to, um, to finding winners, especially if you're talking about building a long-term portfolio, which it sounds like you, you are. Your, your, your goal, it seems to be, is I'm going to focus on buying high-quality leaders, not laggards. I'm not going to be worried as much about the valuation of a company as I am its potential optionality or its um, revenue growth now or the type of revenue it generates, i.e. recurring versus non-recurring revenue. It sounds like those are the things that are, are much more important to you. Um, when it comes to things like management, Brian, how are you, how are you, I mean, you're, you're obviously, you're check marking off these things on your list. You're, you're kind of, you know, to, to get there, but some of them are a little bit more subjective. You know, obviously the moat is a little bit subjective. Um, management's a little bit subjective. What do you look for or how, what resource do you use to help you decide, okay, yeah, I'm going to check mark on management or I'm going to check mark on moat? This uh, investing is subjective, period. And my checklist, one of the downfalls of it is it takes subjective things and tries to put numbers uh, on them. I know when I'm doing this that my methodology is flawed, period. Like it's just flawed. So when I'm going through and I'm trying to assign a numeric numbers to things like how wide is a company's moat? What is the company's optionality? I know that I'm gonna be wrong. Uh, on there. However, I'm still, I'm still a fan of doing it because I would rather be directionally accurate as opposed to specifically uh, accurate. And I still think the process of actually, I actually think the process of going through and taking a company through the checklist is more valuable, way more valuable than the actual output uh, of the company. Because in general, I like to put my capital behind the highest scores that I can find and stay away from the lowest scores that I can find. Uh, but there's still some, uh, there, there are still some companies that would be great investments that get a terrible score. And there will be some terrible investments uh, that get a great score. So I know that going in. If a company gets a terrible score, I will just invest less if I'm still interested, uh, for example, because I, 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 it's riskier. But you're absolutely right that things like optionality, uh, moat, uh, management, it's really hard to quantify those. With management in particular, I'm looking for a couple of things. Uh, first off, I'm looking for something that's called soul in the game. I believe this is uh, attributed to uh, Nassim Taleb, the anti-fragile, uh, wonderful author of the anti-fragile books. Essentially, what I want to care, what I care about is finding a management team and specifically a CEO that cares more about the long-term trajectory of the company than the short-term trajectory uh, of a company. Well, how do you do that? Well, a shortcut is, did, did the person found the company? If they founded the company, they took the company from nothing to publicly traded. And they have battle scars galore uh, uh, on themselves, and they're already rich. They are literally already rich. The odds are favorable that that founder cares more about the long-term health of the business more than they do about any short-term performance results. Because again, the reason they founded the business in the first place was because they cared about something, the opportunity in the, in the long-term, uh, not the short-term. So I, I, I assign a lot of points if it's a founder. If it's not a founder, I want to know that the, the, the CEO has been there for a long period of time. I would just much rather invest in a, comp in, a, in a CEO that's been at a company for 10 plus years. They have a lot of their personal career capital tied up in the company as opposed to something that's just a hired gun that just took over six months ago. So 
tenure uh, is, 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 a, is, a part, is a part of it. Uh, number two is ownership. How much of the, of the stock do they own themselves? This is a tricky one uh, because I want to see a high. I, I want to see a high number on a percentage basis. But if a company is run by someone that's not the founder, it's very rare that they would own a significant chunk of the stock. But even still, if it's a founder, I want to see that they still own, let's say, five percent uh, of the company. Uh, number number three, I look at Glassdoor ratings. Uh, I believe that great companies are also great places to work, and Glassdoor is a good shortcut for figuring out is this place well regarded by employees or not? So I assign more points if they get a good glass door ratings or indeed is another one. And that's, I, I give less points if people say it's a terrible place to work. Uh, uh, finally, I look at the mission statement uh, of the company. I'm a huge believer in the power of mission statements and most companies suck at producing mission statements. There is just corporate fluff that they, they don't talk about, they don't care about. And I would much rather invest in a company that has a mission that they constantly communicate to, uh, to shareholders, to employees, uh, to, to, to the market, as opposed to one that didn't even bother uh, to create one. Uh, finally, I look at how has the management team done it executing? Since this management team took the company public, has it beaten the market? Have they consistently exceeded Wall Street's uh, expectations? So it's a combination of adding up all of those soft factors together to figure out, is this management team worth betting on or not? That was extremely thorough. And it's very, very clear that your, your due diligence is, is definitely top tier. So I want to uh, flip this now because just as important as identifying stocks to buy, it's also important to know when to sell. And we've talked a lot about sell strategy in uh, basically since the start of the new year. Um, Todd, that was Todd's new year's, new year's resolution is to uh, improve his um, improve his sell strategy and, you know, find better, better points to sell. So how, Brian, how do you, um, how do you identify when to sell a stock and like kind of when your, when your initial thesis has broken? There are 11 reasons that I will sell a stock. Overall, I have become extremely reluctant to sell stocks. The reason is, I have sold stocks, many stocks that have since gone on to absolutely pulverize the market. Todd, I sold Dexcom at seven. That <laughs> that's, all right, that's all right, Pride. I owned Amazon back in the late 1990s. <laughs> For those that don't know, Dexcom is currently trading at about 350. <laughs> so I sold at least a, a 50 bagger. And that wasn't the only great company that I, that I, that I sold. So overall, my general thesis is to be extremely reluctant uh, to sell because I put so much time into finding great companies up front and, and buying them. I just have learned the hard way that you just don't want to sell great businesses. You just have to give them an extreme amount of time, even if they underperform for a couple of years, um, to pr prove themselves out. So that's my overarching theme is don't sell. However, there are reasons that I will sell. Number one is the most important. And that is, I was wrong. I was wrong about this, the, the company. Uh, I misjudged the moat. It wasn't as wide as I thought. Uh, outside forces, I thought didn't matter. Turns out uh, they did. Uh, I was wrong about the management team. I was wrong about the, the brand. Uh, the company bull thesis for owning a stock changed because of, say, um, uh, something in the company changed. Basically, it all boils down to, I was wrong. My assessment of the company uh, was wrong. If I, I get the sense that I'm just flat out wrong about a company. I don't mind selling and, and deploying my capital elsewhere. Uh, number two, uh, accounting irregularities. If I can't trust the numbers, you're dead to me. I'm not going to bother with any company where I can't trust the numbers. Uh, number three, uh, a mega acquisition that I don't like myself. Uh, if, a, if a company came across and they spent spent a huge amount of money to acquire um, a competitor or something in a completely unrelated market, and it just changed the thesis altogether of the business, um, 
I, I, I would consider selling it. Uh, number four, thesis complete with no compelling second act. So a company does everything that it's supposed to do and captures its market opportunity, but there's nowhere for it to grow. So it, it, it's, it's captured all of its market opportunity and it hasn't yet built a second revenue stream that's gonna carry the growth torch. Uh, if that's the case, I don't mind declaring victory and getting my capital into uh, smaller companies. Uh, number five, uh, cultural deterioration or, or management exodus. If um, a leader leaves or if the glass door ratings plunge or there's lots of executive turnover, um, I'll, I'll sell. Uh, number six, extreme valuation compared to opportunity. So if a company is trading at a huge valuation and it's worth like $100 billion, for example, and I think that the biggest the company could get is $200 billion, um, I, I don't mind selling or, or trimming or just not, not buying in that case. Um, but it's compared to the market opportunity. If a company is trading at a very high valuation and it's worth $5 billion, but I could see it being a $50 billion company one day, I won't sell. So it's about how big it is compared to how big I think it could be. Um, that plus valuation, I would, I would sell. Uh, number seven, it's too big of a position for me personally. So I keep a diversified portfolio. If a single stock went over 15% of my assets, I would trim. And if it was a, and that would be an awesome business. Like if Amazon was 15% of my capital, uh, I would start to trim it. Uh, if it was a great business that was much higher risk, uh, I would trim at a lower percentage uh, basis. Hey, Brian, never, before you jump on, I just want to jump in real quick with a question on, because you, you mentioned you, you like to cap it at 15%. And like, I, I'm very similar. Um, for a great company, what are your starting positions? Like when you start a position, is it a 1% position? Is it a 3% position? I buy in half percent increments. So 0.5% of my capital is what I put into a company. And I stop adding at 3%. Of my of my capital, uh, once it's there, it has to earn its earn its position. So if it's gotten to a fifteen percent, Todd, it's because it's been a spectacular investment, and that's like best case scenario, uh, right? But that that's how I buy. Uh, so number eight is I lost interest in the company. I am just no longer interested in following it. Uh, number nine, it gets acquired, and I don't want to invest in the acquiree company. Uh, number ten. I want the money for my personal life. The whole reason we invest in the first place is to grow our capital, to spend it on uh, luxuries in life. So if I want to buy something, uh, I will. And the final reason I'll sell is tax loss harvesting. If a stock is down and I don't have high conviction in it coming back, I will sell to, um, to reduce my tax bill. That's a, that's a great list. And I love how rules-based it is. And it just, I think that, investors need to do more journaling. They need to do more rules. They need to put in practices and processes, things that are repeatable. And I really do believe that, you know, a methodology like what you've outlined both on the, on the, for identifying winners and, and for identifying when to sell is so key because it, it helps you remain proactive. The last thing we want to be as investors is reactive. We want to be proactive. And you know, you can buy a stock that's doubled already. You can buy a stock that's tripled already. That's fine. As long as, the, to your point, you can justify that the, the market opportunity is large enough where that could still grow 10x, 10, 20x, whatever it happens to be. I mean, right, Brian, I mean, just going back to Dexcom, I mean, you see a stock that could go from three to seven, right? Seven to 20, 20 to 300 eventually over time. So I think that, that it's very important to, um, to have these kind of practices and processes and this, this regimen that you take your stocks through. And, you know, one of the things just, that's a naturally nice segue for us. One of the things that Joe always asks me every week when we come on that, when, when we're doing our normal podcast is he, he likes to have, find out what kind of stocks are actually on my radar. Now, what are some of the stocks that I'm putting through the gauntlet, if you will. I was just curious if there's anything on your radar now that you wouldn't mind sharing with us. Sure, I have tons of stocks in my radar, but before we get to that, I wanna go back to one thing that you said. Um, everything that I've talked about and have written down, um, I was doing all this before, I was just doing it all in my head. I was trying to keep all of this going in my head, and I think investors are doing all of this work 
anyway. But if you can take the time to slow down and actually write things out, it just clarifies your thinking uh, so much. Like those 11 rules I have for selling, I'm sure many, of pe many people have those same rules. It's just that they haven't taken the time to actually uh, write them down. So overall, when it comes to anything related to money, uh, personal finance or investing, take the time to write down rules for yourself. And you're the boss when you're writing down the rules. And then once the rules are written down, those rules are the boss of you. And it just is so freeing to, to, to clarify your mind because when you're in the, middle of the, in the middle of the week and you want to buy or sell a stock, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by what you're seeing on the screen. But if you have rules that you can get back to, it just clarifies uh, thinking and makes decision making uh, uh, easier. Uh, as for stocks that uh, I like right now, even though that we're at all time uh, highs, uh, one stock that I am really very interested in and I've become a shareholder uh, of in the last uh, couple of months is similar uh, scientific. Uh, the stock ticker there is uh, SMLR. Have you guys ever heard of this company? Yes. Okay. Yes. I don't own it currently, but I am familiar with it. But if you can walk through the listeners on what your, uh, what your both thesis is, that'd be awesome. The, very, the, the, the overriding gist is that um, the company is focused on peripheral artery disease, which is when uh, there is a blockage in, uh, in, in your veins, in your arteries, in the body due to the progressive buildup of fat. 75% of people who have peripheral artery uh, disease don't know uh, that they have it. And that's a big problem because if you have it, your chances of having a heart attack or a stroke or having some adverse event that sends you to the hospital skyrocket. They like double or triple. So if we can diagnose peripheral artery disease easier, uh, we can save a whole bunch of money uh, down the road as well as a whole bunch of um, uh, heartache um, by, by, by uh, keeping people out of the, of the hospital. The problem right now is diagnosing peripheral artery disease is very time consuming uh, and, and tricky. So this company, Similar Scientific, again, SMLR, they developed this little clip that goes on your fingers and on your toes. And within five minutes, uh, this little clip measures the amount of flow, the blood flow that's happening to all four uh, of your extremities. If it detects that blood flow is restricted to any of your extremities, uh, your provider will know in a matter of minutes that there could be something wrong. It needs further uh, evaluation. And if there's something wrong, take action. Start taking some drugs, get a surgery, do something to prevent a adverse event down the road. Uh, Semler is the only company that is, uh, is doing this and their innovation is really about speed. So they can do this with, with no training in a matter of a few, a few minutes. What excites me about Semler is that they're not focused on selling the clip that goes on your finger. They sell the reports that, that go to the physician. So it's either a subscription-based payment or it's a uh, one-time, it's a, a per-use uh, payment. So it's up to the physician uh, to choose. There's that recurring revenue that you love so much. Uh, not only do they have recurring revenue, uh, Todd, but this is a company that's worth maybe six, seven hundred uh, million dollars. But because it's software-based, uh, to your point, yes, it is recurring revenue, but it's ridiculously high margin uh, too. Their gross margin is over 90%. And while the company is still pretty darn small, I think their revenue for this year is going to be 30 or 40 million dollars, uh, they already have, they're already extremely profitable. Their net margin, so after all expenses are, are taken out, including taxes, is over 30%. So they have very, very high uh, growth. They're expected to grow over 40% uh, next year. They're already profitable. They're already cash flow positive. They have a clean balance sheet with lots of cash, no debt. They have optionality, and I think they have a tremendous uh, growth runway ahead of them. Despite everything I just said, they're trading at less than 30 times earnings. Earnings, not sales, earnings. So, <laughs> you know, it's so funny, Brian, <laughs> when you said 30 times earnings in my head, because I'm just so used to now everybody looking at prices and sales. That's what, that's what I thought. I thought, oh, 30 times sales, that sounds pretty pricey still though, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Uh, that's the great thing about having earnings uh, is that you, it's trading at, uh, oh, I guess it's over, over that now. I guess the stock's up a, a little bit. But this is a company that I could easily see growing for a long, long time uh, at a double digit rate because the opportunity ahead is so uh, large. And they're also making investments and other potential technologies that, that they could bring to, uh, to, to market. But uh, this is a company I think has tremendous operating leverage. And I, I think it's fairly low risk. There's 
issues for sure with uh, customer concentration uh, in particular, but this is one that I am uh, a shareholder of and I'm planning on buying uh, many, many more times over the next couple of years. You know, Brian, you, you know so much about that stock. If I, if I was a fool, I would think that you worked for the company. It's actually pretty remarkable how, how, how thorough your due diligence is. So I would love to hear maybe just one or two other stocks that are kind of on your, on your radar in a, in a similar way that you've done like some pretty extensive research on. Sure. Uh, Pinterest, P-I-N-S. This is my wife's favorite company, period, which is always a, a, a good sign. Uh, Pinterest is a online bulleted board for uh, finding images that you that you love. And I believe it is, it's a social network of sorts. There is a social component to it, but that's not why people uh, use it. Uh, Pinterest calls itself a, a visual search engine. So you go there and you type in uh, kitchen uh, ideas, uh, uh, recipes, uh, vacations, etc. And Pinterest comes back at you with all kinds of visuals. And one thing I love about them is uh, the, way they describe, the way they describe people using the platform is when they see something, uh, they know that's it. They, they don't have the words to describe what they're looking for, but when they see it, uh, they, they, they know that's what they, uh, they want. That to me is incredibly conducive uh, to going from there uh, to commercial sales. Like if you see something that you want in your home, it's a very natural extension to say, yes, I, I want to buy that. So therefore, I think that the potential of the platform is almost as high as Facebook from a monetization uh, uh, perspective, uh, to let alone the fact that there's no calls for people to break up Pinterest or that Pinterest is destroying democracy or, or anything uh, like that. Uh, so Pinterest has been a big time winner uh, since, it, uh, since it came public, but it's still very early in its monetization uh, efforts. So I think that that will be a company that ramps up its user base uh, over time and continues to attract more than its fair share of brands and advertising dollars uh, away from traditional media. So I think that Pinterest has tremendous growth potential, even from here. You've been actually right on top of Pinterest for a long time. I mean, I remember when it was really in the discard pile, nobody was really paying attention to it at all. And you were out there saying, geez, this is great. This is great. This is great. And, you know, you talk about um, how, you know, you know, notice it was something that your wife uses a lot. Same thing. Um, you know, and it's a very, it's a very, um, it's a friendly environment to be on within social media uh, is, is kind of a unique um, to be able to go onto a site um, and just enjoy yourself. <laughs> and, and moreover, it's like, if I, I'm on Twitter all the time. Why, why do you go to Twitter? I go to Twitter to engage with other people. Ads are a distraction. Ads detract from the experience. Same with Facebook, same with Snapchat. People go to Twitter, uh, to, to Pinterest to see ads. That's a reason <laughs> they go to Pinterest. It, just that fact alone makes me believe that Pinterest has tremendous monetization potential. Yeah, and I agree with you. It's a stock that I own in my portfolio as well. I, I like it. I love, I love it. I'm, I'm long it as well. Um, Brian, geez, you know, we, we could probably go on and, and kill an entire day. I'm going to have to have you come back because eventually at some point we have to put a pin in today's conversation. I might as well uh, take advantage of the opportunity and do that now. But I tell you, Brian, you've been just so generous with your time. And I just loved going through the, these, these, the system that you have and the way that you've made this very repeatable. I just think it's wonderful seeing you and, and thank you so much for coming on and talking to us today. Always great chat with an old friend, Todd. So, Joe, nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on, Brian.